Uh, the globe is a system, an ecological system of weather and so on. So it extrapolates from the micro to the macro. So this is the design I came up with. Um, so I proposed to build it 12 feet high and it's painted. So if you can see in the photograph, it's bright red. Uh, I recently well, a number of months ago, got a call from the new owner of the building, and he, uh, the piece is faded because it's uh, 20 years, 25 years or so, <laughs> 25 years. So uh, it needs to be repainted. So hopefully he will do that. He wanted me to do it for free, but uh, that's, that's just not the way it works. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was difficult to build because these are compound curves and commercial metal had a, a really good roller operator at the time so each of these S shapes had to be made in five sections in order to get all these compound curves to work together smoothly so it turned out to be a more complex project to build than we really expected so again I didn't make any money but uh, it was an interesting experience. It was fun. Um, I will pull in another maquette. This, some of you may have seen in downtown Dayton, close to the neon movies at Patterson and Fifth. Uh, this is the installed piece. Uh, this piece is called Fluid Dynamics. Uh, Bill Flaum of the Flaum Publishing family wanted to honor his uh, uh, family history in a publishing business in Dayton for 150 years or something. So he and his extended family had a sculpture competition and a number of, looked at a number of local artists and I proposed this as in the theme of fluid dynamics and they liked this. So the reason I did fluid dynamics is because the site is the location of the old uh, uh, canal that used to run through downtown Dayton uh, on which uh, freight was carried but they also used the water to generate electricity for the local new local industry. Also now it's just a little traffic island the sculptures on a traffic island and the traffic goes along creating fluid dynamics in the air uh, eddies and vortexes in the air. Uh, You've probably seen in muddy water uh, vortexes like this. Uh, I got interested in fluid dynamics <clears throat> reading a book by uh, Joseph uh, Theodor Schwenk of Switzerland. He was a, a student or whatever of uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner, the Theosophist. And uh, fluid dynamics is found throughout nature from our bodies to the spiral nebula. And also the other aspect of the fluid dynamics is at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, a lot of their research and work is, uh, involves fluid dynamics primarily in the air. So, but even with things like shooting rockets and you name it. Uh, so uh, the Flaums uh, thought this was appropriate theme for their project, so I got to build it with uh, Buddy, with Commercial Metal Fab, and it was powder-coated aluminum. Uh, Legacy down in Franklin did the powder coating. This is Morningstar 2. It's 15 feet diameter, and that was its installation at World Expo in Brisbane, Australia, under a huge light, uh, neon light installation overhead. It was the center of Expo with the American, the Italian, and uh, Spanish pavilions. And it had a bench all the way around it so people could sit on it. Now, it came out of uh, Morningstar number one, which was uh, made for Case Western University in Cleveland. And it is seven feet diameter uh, on the campus between the Student Union and the Limestone Church on Euclid Avenue. 
And that I made in 1982. I had a studio space at the old car nursery in the back when the barn was still there, and uh, Alan Steiger helped me build it. It was great. So this is the actual original poster board model. Uh, it's slightly different than the uh, finished piece, but essentially the same. Uh, you can see it's got a little bit of mildew on the paper. It's so old. Uh, but this is the original. So I did make a small one in stainless steel about this size, but that went to Case Western at the time. Now this one is a little larger. The reason I did it this way is the red part is the first section I made for the Australian project. So being that that was 15 feet high, uh, that would make the red section uh, 8 or 10 feet high, I can't remember. But I had to make the red part first because all these interior corners had to be re-polished. All this is mirror polished stainless steel on both sides of the sheet. So after the red part was finished, then I could add in the yellow parts. And all these corners had to be re-welded, I mean re-polished. And uh, then the third, uh, the third aspect of the piece is this. So I think we had one of these uh, put together on the big piece before we shipped it, probably like this. Uh, we could not make any more than 12 feet high because in shipping it can't be over 12 feet because it has to go under bridges and such like. So we built a big wooden box around it to send it. So uh, once it got to Brisbane, I spent uh, at least a month there uh, adding on these three sections like that. And uh, they got me a couple of welders, a uh, Kiwi welder, uh, Patrick McCauley, and he did the welding for me, and we did all the repolishing, and it was a big job, but it was fun. It was really exciting to be on Expo site because there's so much activity, and you're building this huge Expo thing, and other artists, and designers, and lighting, and just, uh, it was just amazing. And we stayed in kind of a hotel, and there were a bunch of Russians there from uh, building the Russian pavilion, but they uh, had been told, apparently, by their boss that they weren't supposed to talk to anybody, especially Americans. So we couldn't get a, even a hello out of them. They were kind of afraid of us or afraid of getting in trouble, which was sad because, you know, it's an expo. You're supposed to be able to be friendly and meet everybody. So, but that was the communist period. <laughs> But it was a fabulous uh, thing. And a few friends uh, have seen the, uh, this has been reinstalled in the Botanical Garden in Brisbane, which is downtown Brisbane, a great location. And a few friends have seen it, like Fatty Dallas. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I'll be able to get Paradigm reinstalled, too. This is a motif I've been working with for some time, it's called Fenestrae Aeternitatis, which means window into uh, infinity. Uh, this particular idea was to make it in stone, and it would be, you would have notches uh, interlocking, so it would be assembled kind of like woodworking notches. Um, I did uh, get a commission to build a, a large scale stone sculpture for the public library. At White Rock Hills in east of Dallas, downtown Dallas. So I proposed using Texas pink granite and they, they liked it. And so my original idea is, was four, four large granite books. Now you see in this case, I have the books open, but I, uh, to make that in granite would be very complex. So in fact, I just have a, a, a rectangle. But I carved the edges to look like the pages of a book. So it's a eight and a half feet high, about 52 inches wide, and it's about 18 feet long, the installation. 
which you can see in that far photograph. Uh, and it, the panels that connect are stainless steel. Kind of like, so the idea is that the, the book, the page of the book opens and it connects to the next book and the next book and the next book. One, one book leads to the next book is the theme there. Uh, they seem to be happy with it, and I certainly was. Uh, this motif, was an earlier version, is this red, which used to be at the studio and went to Cary, South Carolina. Uh, it's about eight feet too, just painted stainless steel. And then in 93, my first sculpture symposium was at a steel factory in Dunoy Varos, Hungary, about 75 miles south of uh, Budapest on the Danube River. And so the steel factory, I proposed this motif uh, in a slightly different version uh, to the factory, and we decided that in order to make it affordable, that we would make uh, this part out of tubes, metal tubing, so that it would use much less material. So it turned out to be uh, uh, 33 feet high and 60 feet long and about 7 feet deep. And it's right on the bank overlooking the Dan Danube River, so it's a fabulous location. Um, so uh, I've done, I re oh, then while I was there I made a sand casting in bronze of this motif, and so I have that in my studio. Uh, I really like the idea of it's kind of like in your dreams, uh, you go from sort of one place to another in this kind of magical way, room to room. It's, it's kind of like that. The mo it kind of embodies that kind of experience. Uh, so I like, I like this motif a lot. I like to play with it. So that's the fenestrae. We can move directly up to these two, I think. Uh, and these behind here, I'll take this down. Um, this is my synchronicity motif. Uh, synchronicity, as you may know, is where two disparate uh, <coughs> entities or elements or happenings totally unrelated to each other occur at the same time. Like you're thinking of somebody and they, the tel telephone rings and it's them. Or you get an idea for a sculpture and somebody else gets the same idea on the other side of the world. That sort of synchronicity, the energy of that moment in time. So I wanted to make that as a sculpture. How do you make a sculpture of synchronicity? So I came up with this uh, <clears throat> in playing with my poster board maquettes. I discovered that if you have a pyramid on this side and you have the same pyramid twisted and interlocking on this side, that you end up with a hexagonal shape where those two pyramids connect, interpenetrating. So uh, this is the maquette for a piece I did 11 feet high for Stephen Lou Mason and Kettering. They wanted a create a sculpture park on their property near the golf course there. So I went up to North Bay, Ontario and found this black granite at a quarry and uh, had it shipped down. And I stopped in Stansted and had this uh, hexagonal shape cut out with a diamond wire cutting machine. So that saved a huge amount of work. And then I came back to the studio and carved out these uh, pyramidal surfaces myself. And uh, so instead of poster board, it, it's a, a piece of pine is the maquette. So this, then I got a, won the competition for Cedarville University nearby, wanted a sculpture uh, with the theme of I am the light of the world. So uh, I came up with this big block of granite, 16 feet high, with an opening coming through. So the light is coming through the dark nature 
and illuminating the other side. And this is mirror polished stainless steel on the inner surface to help transmit that light. So it's the same synchronistic motif, but in a different context. Um, so this is at the Masons, and this is at Cedarville University. And this one here, if you can see, uh, I also did another version for the University of Tsinghua University in Beijing. They, uh, the Americans helped establish that university back 100 years ago. And they were having their centennial, and so they wanted to commission 100 sculptures to go around the campus, uh, a number of which were international artists, and I was one of them. And so uh, I thought this would be an appropriate motif, and they seem to have also. So I made another wood maquette of this one and sent it over, and their stone factory made it. I didn't do any carving on it, but they did a great job, so I'm, I was very happy with that. Uh, I suppose we can continue, just since we're right here, into the next piece. Uh, this is Shiva Shiwana. Shiva, as you know, is the god of creation, destruction, recreation. Uh, the competition, I guess it was a competition, it was in 1980 for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, very large array, about 50 miles west of Socorro, New Mexico, on the plains of San Augustine. There wasn't a theme in particular. They wanted a sculpture for in front of their new headquarters. They have 27 or 28 of these white radio telescopes. They're five stories high. And they're, they're situated, they have all these stations they can be placed at and they can be moved around on these railroad tracks. And the railroad tracks are in the configuration of a Y, so that you have all these stations. So you can put them, spread them out, or have them all come close together to get different readings. So, uh, and that area is roughly the size of downtown Washington, D.C., as I recall. It's so big. So, uh, I wanted to, I thought of what would be appropriate for that site. So, uh, one way to incorporate the site, the railroad tracks, is in a tetrahedral configuration. And secondly, what they're reading is uh, objects in space, floating in, in uh, up in, what do you call it, space. <laughs> so uh, those objects floating in space are three-dimensional, primarily spherical. I didn't want to do a sphere, but I wanted a structure that was uh, totally three-dimensional and spherical, so I designed this tetrahedral piece. And it also, I, I think you could read it uh, as looking a little bit like a Sputnik, maybe, or a uh, man-made construction that might be floating off in space. So I had also, it points into space. And then on the ends, I put these uh, shapes. There's a, on the ocean, the Navy used to have these radar things that have a, a certain shaped interior where any, from any angle, these bouncing radar reflectors would take that radar signal and bounce it right back. And so I have those on the ends. So um, I'm trying to uh, symbolize a, uh, this uh, aspect of space that they are studying. Uh, ideally, this would float in space instead of be balanced on one leg, like Shiva. You've probably seen the sculptures of sh dancing Shiva. Uh, so that's why I picked that name, because it's so appropriate for what they're studying, the birth of stars and destruction of stars and so on. And Shiwana, I found, is the name of a healer who has received his powers through being struck by lightning. And that's from the, I think, a Acoma tribe? I'm pretty sure it was the Acoma in that area of New Mexico. 
So I've incorporated the, the original stargazers from that area into the sculpture, as well as the Indian stargazers who had wonderful astronomy uh, observatories many, many centuries ago. So that's how that piece came to be. It's about 15 feet diameter, and I believe it's still there. I think you can even see it on Google Earth. <laughs> Uh, this sculpture is, um, what is it, Love Seat. Uh, the first one I did is in uh, Ichon, South Korea. It's a, a sculpture symposium. Their theme was benches for the pedestrian street. So this was one of the blocks I found there, and I got help carving out this seat. And there's another one on the other side, and they, when the, where they interconnect, there's an opening through which you can talk. So you can have a secret uh, uh, meeting and not be seen together, but you can still talk and pass notes. And I don't think you can kiss through it, but you can pass notes through it. So this is uh, Yo Wool Kang. She was the daughter of the fellow running the symposium. So I asked her to write a love poem. So on the other side, the smooth side, we engraved the love poem she wrote. So this is. A maquette. I have a block uh, out in front of the studio. It's a giant surface plate from right pad. It's six feet by eight feet. And I would love to make a uh, love seat with it. And this is how I would do that with the seat on either side that joins in the center and probably engrave some kind of poem up here. So this one I haven't realized but this one I have, so it's a, it's a motif I like to work with. This is Cloud and Rain. Uh, it's one of my sung tube series. You might recall the suspended sung tube series. I've <clears throat> actually done a quite a number of smaller scale pieces uh, that refer to that concept of the round tubular space and the square form. Uh, this is a pretty, a bit of an abstraction of that, but it is a tube and it does go through a squarish stone, which I found a moraine stone and drilled some holes and popped off some surfaces. So, uh, now this is, as you can see, rather heavy, even though it's small. So, uh, I was asked to propose a piece to the China-U.S. Peace and Friendship Program uh, in 2010, celebrating the 30 years of detente between China and the U.S. And so uh, the Chinese director of that uh, project saw my photograph for this and really thought it was appropriate. So they built this in China. It's got the stainless steel tube going all the way through, and this looks exactly like this stone. In fact, it's not stone. It's a special resin, cement resin mixture that's very strong and also very light. So while this is probably six by eight feet by four or five, so it's huge, looks, and it, if it were real, it would weigh 10 or 12,000 pounds. But in fact, it probably only weighs, I don't know, 500 pounds maybe or something like that. So. Uh, but it looked just like a stone, so most people think it's just a stone and very heavy. Uh, I think of it as cloud and rain. That's how I, why I titled it this, but it's in the Sung Tube series, uh, which is the unity of heaven and earth, so it's all kind of related. This is one of my uncarved block series, another motif I like to explore. Uh, it's about eight inches high or so. Uh, as you can see, I've cut in here. On this side, I left the drill hole. This side I polished and left flat. And here's a second cut. So that cut joins in the center to the first cut. Sometimes I do all three, and so we have a more, more spacious piece. 
But this, uh, this is granite. It looks like granite from uh, Aswan, Egypt, but I, I can't remember exactly. Uh, this is uh, the five or six foot high version I did at a symposium in Stansted, Quebec, uh, a number of years ago. It's uh, local granite there, <clears throat> and it was done essentially like this with just two cuts. That was uh, it's very interesting to be in Quebec, wonderful country, and wonderful people, and food, great food. Uh, I've done, I've been, I made quite a few of this motif. I like to, I like balance. I like working with balance, and that comes out of practice of Tai Chi Chuan which is all about balance. Uh, so it's fun to play with balance with such heavy things as stone, big blocks of stone. I've done some even bigger than that <coughs> in Lithuania and Germany and Lebanon, places like that. Um, I, the title is Uncarved Block, and that comes from the Zen 